Hello, I'm going to be speaking in English, trying to address the foreign observers in Armenia, the foreign embassies, and all sorts of foreign agents and Trojan horses currently steering up the situation in Armenia on behalf of their country's respective national interests. As an introduction, I would like to briefly walk you through what's been happening in Armenia. A year ago, there had been parliamentary elections the Republican Party of Armenia became the winning majority party in the parliament. However, unlike his previous promise, the head of that political party, Serge Sarkisian, was re-elected into the prime minister's position by this parliament. The opposition party that had gained 7% of the votes of the people had recognized those elections legit so did the international observers. However, the opposition started um, a revolt, um, an act of complaint by walking, marching the streets, closing down the streets, uh, uh, shouting that Sev Sarkisian should step down as he had promised. And people followed the suit because the opposition's main slogan was that they just want the Prime Minister stepping down. No one knew who's going to come afterwards. They claimed they will not try to, the opposition claimed they won't try to abuse their powers. They won't try to stick to the chairs, to cling on them, that they will try to create calm and democratic conditions for a new election. And indeed, he had succeeded, the Prime Minister stepped down, the Republican Party didn't march people on the streets against their compatriots. Hence, we avoided any violence. There had been no clashes. There had been a peaceful passage of power, which was followed by the election of um, Nikol Pashinyan, the head of the opposition, as the new uh, temporary Prime Minister. He was given by the law, he was given the time until the next year's May to appoint his team and to do things the way he had promised regarding the pensions, uh, the defense, uh, healthcare, education, culture, everything. All the reins of power, of executive power, were placed in his hands. However, not having had any other experience but gathering demonstrations and running populist revolts and some other parts of his biography which I'm not going to address here now, instead of starting to do his work after appointing his team, he continued on uh, working on the populist wave. The populist wave has the textbook criteria for any colored revolution you can imagine. Character assassination of everyone else, of all the governments, apart from the first Armenian president's government, Levanter Petrosians, in the 90s, during the Karabakh war years, where Levanter Petrosian, towards the end of his term, was ousted out of his office by the people because he wanted to give away the independence of the people of Artsakh. Now, Levanter Petrosian has been the mentor of Nikol Pashinyan. This has been uh, a liberal uh, slash neoliberal, extremely neoliberal wing of politicians who have gathered around them uh, a truly Trojan horse of a group of youth and activists who have been solely working based on the Western textbooks prepared for Eastern Europeans. There is a very big difference in the way campaigns are organized in the West, Western European, in the old Europe, so to speak, and the way that things are being pushed through info wars in those countries which the West, the US, um, the EU, NATO, view as a battleground for their interests with Russia or against Russia and Iran. Armenia is a connecting link 
between the Russian and Iranian unity connectivity. We have been able to manage this balance of power and manage our own peaceful existence for the past 27 years. We have serious agreements of cooperation from economic to military with Iran and with Russia. Because this is the, the one way that all the powers had agreed was the best solution to avoid a massive scale war. Now, now that we have the colored revolutions moving from the Arab world throughout to Ukraine, Georgia, now we have the situation in Syria and Iraq somehow trying to be resolved. The next step, the next stage for this war, for these continuous wars, very Trotskyist in their nature, um, in Iran. Now the main target is Iran. Therefore, this balance that had been existing for so many years has to be crushed, it has to be squashed. In order to do so, something has to be done to disconnect geographically, physically, culturally, disconnect, create a huge gap between Russia and Iran in order to isolate both countries with their own regards from the perspective of national and security interests of outside powers. Meaning, in no manner, in no way, do any of these info wars, these mini, tiny little um, games, these little theaters of, of colored revolutions, not really revolutions, um, that these powers organize uh, for our countries. We, none, none have our interests as their priority. Our interest is not to have a war with anyone. At the same time, not to give up our sovereignty. At the same time, not to give up the independence and the right to self-determination of the Armenian, Armenian country of Artsakh that legally hasn't been a part of Azerbaijan. And it fought is its way into survival. We fought it. With blood and sweat, tears, we have been living through hell in the 90s. And it was our first battle where we were able to insist on our right of existence. Since 1915, the genocide. For the first time we were able, first time in 700 years, we managed to insist on the right of our existence. We have a beautiful homeland. We have a homeland that is together united with the people of Artsakh and Armenia and the large diaspora. I get asked this question in Europe, why so many Armenians live outside? My dear European fellows, we live outside because for the past four or five centuries, at least once every century, you have initiated a similar operation against Iran or Turkey or Russia and you used us, you used us as a, as a, as a carpet on which you step. You, you stepped over our interest over and over again, giving us false hopes, um, diplomatically giving promises about one thing, in reality de facto doing another thing. Let's not go too far in Syria. And Iraq, the Armenian communities, historical, old communities, older than some of your civilizations are, have been targeted, have been annihilated by the ISIS, of which you wash your hands. You say, oh, we don't know how ISIS was formed. We, we don't know the war in Syria, Iraq. We're here to bring democracy, freedom. Somehow you're refusing to take it. Now you're bringing this democracy and freedom to Armenia. We have a huge operation of Trojan horse of organizations who come into Armenia. And I'm going to speak about one of them, which made a very funny statement today. Our prime minister doing all of his demonstrations on popular mode, confusing purposefully the ochlocracy with democracy 
keeps gathering people in the squares instead of going and facing his opponents in the parliament, refuses to go on TV debates with his opponents, refuses to debate leading Russian journalists of Armenian descent. Instead, flies and gives loyalty speeches to Europe, to Russia, to Europe, to Russia, without understanding what our agenda really is, not advising with us. He hasn't been elected yet because his party doesn't have a majority in the parliament yet. This is what he's trying to gain. Legitimately, he should have waited till next year's May month in order for him to prove what he's capable of. And he's incapable of doing the work while there is a true strong opposition as is due in any parliamentary country. And this is why he took the populist way using all the info wars, all the tools you have provided him with, and he does have a political yellow journalism background, he's been using grants and financing from the West constantly. This is his career. So he's using this experience, not the experience of a leader who tries to fix the economy, the really urgent issues. No, he's using the populist agenda by bringing people on the square and threatening his opponents and saying, if you don't abide, I'm going to unleash these people on you. Like there are some, some groups of jackals or whatever. And he does character assassination of all our previous leaders, leaders who have won the war. We exist today because of certain people's incredibly dedicated service selfless service and we don't have the time to get together all of us the armenians to discuss how this should go but you already have your your say i'm going to say a couple of phrases he's using against his opponents we are going to smash your faces on the asphalt we are going to crush your heads on the walls if anyone dares to even suspect any one of my team members as being influenced from any other foreign country will be considered a traitor. And I will have the national security and the military intelligence to go personally after each and every one of them. Now, he's shouting this. He is shouting this with the same voice, Hitler had been giving a speech before World War II. And your embassies, your representatives are in Armenia and you hear this voice. You walk by that square. You know our Armenia, you know our country many years ago. You know this doesn't correspond to our culture. The culture of democracy that we've been trying to build. Nothing is perfect, of course. Nothing was perfect in Syria either, but it definitely was better than what it is now. Don't you think so? Didn't you go after Syria for the same purpose, for Iran? To make an ease of an access towards Iran. The same thing applies to Iraq. And now it's our turn. But no, Armenia is in military partnership with Iran, with Russia. We've been trying to keep a balance in the region. So this goes out of the window. In comes yet another colored revolution with such threats. I am a person who doesn't share his view on Armenia's vision. I do not believe that neoliberalism is our future. I'm a conservative. I have every right to express my opinion. And it is not my fault that he has appointed in his team people whose entire career has been done in Western financed NGOs. NGOs, another word for intelligence operators and agents who cannot come in as such. You pursue your national interest in my country. And you do not allow me to pursue my national interest in my country. I do not bring my national interest to your country and force them onto you. Why do you think you have the right to do that in my country? How do you do that? 
by supporting this man. Who supported this man? Let's read about them. Let's read the report, shall we? Remember, this is a man who threatens everyone with jail. Anyone who doesn't agree with him. Anyone. I've never been a member of any political party in Armenia. Never. But isn't it a true European value? To say, I reserve my right not to agree with you. But I will give my life to defend your right to your opinion. Isn't this the core of European value? Anyone being free to speak their mind? Am I urging anyone to go on war? Am I urging anyone to say, to be corrupt, to be wrong? No. I criticized, I criticized, I refused to work with several teams throughout my life, throughout my career, because I found their practices unacceptable. However, I see the real threat now that the situation in the country will go from bad to worse. However, before that, it was going progressively, step by step forward. Isn't this the way Europe pursues? Instead of having bouts of little wars and killing each other and bouts of nationalism or bouts of uh, whatever fascism bit of conservative type or progressive type. Isn't this the way? This was the right way. We were on the right way. You were cooperating. But now there is another agenda. There is the NATO agenda to go there. So here we have various Soros-linked organizations, Madeleine Albright-linked organizations, Henry Kissinger-linked organizations, organizations working very closely with the intelligence community in Brussels against Russian interests, against Iranian interests. In other words, my country is one of the pressure buttons that can be used against Russia or Iran. And you use it at your own whim when it suits your timing, when it suits your interest. You do not consider our right to our homeland as a peaceful, blossoming country. We know how to build a country. We've been living in your countries. We've been building there. Don't you think we can build there? When you ask why we live there, you've been doing the same mistake towards us over and over again. And I don't want that to happen again. I am a descendant of survivors of genocide. I survived the war and the hunger of the 90s in extreme conditions. That was done under your promises of democracy and human rights. You had promised us then. I lived on 200 grams of bread a day, two hours of electricity on a rotational basis, meaning one week you get it from midnight to 2 a.m., the next week you get from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. That's as much electricity as you can have. No hot water, minus 20 degrees winter. This is what we have lived when you sold your dream in the first time. Your goal was to hit Russia. And we were the door which you broke to get there. And now I'm telling my nation is going to stand a closed door. This is my opinion. This is my view. And I consider employees of foreign intelligence NGOs working against my country's, my nation's interest because our very life is on the line again. There is an organization, dear Western Europeans, it's called ENEMO. It is a European network of election monitoring organizations. It's beautiful. You can go to their website, open uh, to see who finances them, which organizations. And you will see a full picture of how to interfere into other countries' elections, into other countries' decision-making processes that are of pure um, sovereign nature. We do not owe our way of life to you. We owe it to ourselves, to our survival. And uh, we have now an organization specifically created for Eastern European countries the former USSR countries, that hopes from one election to another, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, financed by various, various, an octopus of a group of organizations, Department of State of the US, various foreign ministries of these beautiful human rights loving uh, European countries, 
Right. And this is their statement. Today, after our Prime Minister threatened anyone who doesn't agree with him, anyone who dares to say anything about his team members being Western hires at some point in their careers, it's on their CVs, on public access, you can open and read, he threatens us with the national security, whose mission is supposed to protect us, in a way, sometimes even from him. So, according to the interim report of the European Network of Election Monitoring Organizations, an organization observing the general election of Armenia, the campaigning is proceeding calmly and peacefully. The NMO mission head Zlatko Vujovic told the news conference today that there is big progress in preventing state resource abuses compared to the previous electoral processes, which also concerns implementation of electoral administration. When you are threatening people, your opposition, with the national security, this is the utmost abuse of not only the administrative resource, this is abuse of law, abuse of human rights, this is an outright violation. You are fabricating a case against the second president of Armenia. Because that is his key opponent. This is the one person that will not allow any one of you, any one of you, including him, to put any gap between Russia and Iran. This is the one politician with a greed to stand up and say, my country's national interest dictates otherwise. What do we do? We fabricate a case against him. There were tragic events, horribly tragic events in the year 2008, 1st of March, whereby the second president had ordered the establishment of the order in the country by an opposition run by Mr. Pashinyan and his colleagues from the first Armenian president's um, term who marched the people on the streets and there were deaths. There was a leaked tape conversation between the head of the investigative special investigative committee of Armenia and the head of the national security uh, agency whereby one is telling the other that the Prime Minister, Mr. Nikol Pashinyan, has specified that no matter what, something has to be fabricated, something has to be done in order to put the second president in. Interference into the judiciary, abuse of power, and use and abuse of administrative resource in the interest of solely his and his party. Now, this is what is happening. This is unacceptable. Um, nothing should allow you to play with the fate of my nation, considering you haven't done much for eliminating the consequences of the genocide. And you're not going to, because your interests are not our human rights in our region. They never were. Your interests are otherwise dictated by another country, they are regulated by other roundtable discussions to which my country doesn't attend. However, we will not be your pressure button, we will not be the pushover. This is my opinion, I state it clearly, anyone who doubts my words, who thinks there are no facts, you can go do your own research, you can see this organization's website, you see who their financiers are. I myself have a career of international lawyer. I did work in Brussels. I know how lobbying works. I will educate my own people. I will spread every such shouting, every such threat that anyone does to my people, to the entire world. I have the right to do so. It's an inalienable right. And this is my face, remember, because if someone sends someone after me, you will be the first ones I will be reporting to. Congratulations to yet another mess up in a region you haven't gotten a clue of. Congratulations.
Goodbye. Hope to see, hope to see you in better times.